I'd like you all to open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. After these two weeks of being away, I really have felt the Lord compelling me to go in a different direction this first Sunday back. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's pick up reading in verse 24. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. I've entitled my sermon this morning, Winning Requires Discipline. This letter written to these Corinthians, almost everybody agrees that Paul penned this first letter to this early church at Corinth in the mid-50s A.D. In fact, John MacArthur in his study Bible, he's so precise, he even pinpoints it to the first half of A.D. 55. And there's, there's reasons, good reasons, to believe that that may be true if we put together a lot of different facts from these Corinthian letters and the book of Acts. And anyways, there's, there's a lot of digging that can be done there and we don't need to get into that right now. But I point that out because what you might find interesting in this time frame, 55 AD, is that only about 60 miles away from Corinth is a place called Olympia. In B.C. 776, almost 800 years before this letter was written, in the plains of Olympia, the Olympics were started. And they went all the way through Paul's time to almost four centuries afterwards. So for for the better part of 800 years, these people in Corinth, it was so bound up in their their society. This was something that that was a tradition. It happened every four years. It was taking place. Everybody in Corinth knew about the Olympic Games. 60 miles away, that's nothing. Undoubtedly, some of those folks had traveled there, seen the Games. I mean, it would have been, no doubt, a time of festivity, a time of competition, a time when, you know, the... The more wealthy in Corinth would have been able to travel over there and they would have been able to observe these games. This this was not foreign to anybody there. The Olympic Games become this 800-year-old tradition and what God does is says, Paul, take that 800-year-old tradition that all these people are familiar with and use it. Use it to rebuke, use it to warn, and use it to encourage these somewhat carnal Corinthians who are really in danger. Take that and use it as an illustration in their lives to communicate spiritual truth to get them back on track lest they end up being destroyed. So that's basically what we have here. And and the thought I had, you know, as I was meditating on this and I was realizing Paul's using runners, Paul's using boxers, he's using this Olympic illustration that, that... these people knew about is just back several chapters earlier, Paul says something like this. He says, All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. And I got thinking about that. I thought, you know what? The Olympics are for us. The Olympics are for the Christian. It's... it's 
I mean, you, you ask this question, what are the Olympics for? I mean, is it to be entertained by Michael Phelps? Is it for the sake of national pride? Is it for the sake of athletes to show, you know, all they can do? Well, I mean, a lot of people obviously would resort to the Olympic Games for those purposes. But I, I, I really believe that the purpose above all purposes as to why there's an Olympics is because God designed the Olympic Games to be a physical, observable illustration of what the Christian's race from earth to heaven must look like. Did you get that? It must look like that. When Paul brings this up, He's saying, in the way these guys run to win, so you better run to win. And if you don't run that way to win, even I, if I don't run that way to win, even if I'm a preacher of the gospel, I face disqualification. It's pretty serious stuff, folks. The Lord God wants us to see the Olympic Games at another level. He wants us to see... The, the training, I mean, he wants us to see these guys out there wet. They're, they're, they've got their training regimen. They're out there, they're running, they're pressing themselves. I mean, I can remember Joshua was, uh, Ruby got from the library some, some deal on Tim Tebow and, and Ruby and Joshua re, were reading it together. And Tebow was saying that what drove him is he knew he, when he was lifting weights and when he was running and when he was exercising and when he was doing this, he kept thinking to himself, he wanted to be doing it when nobody else was doing it. He wanted that edge. He wanted to push. He wanted to press. He wanted to be everything he possibly could be. And, and that's the kind of thing that God wants us to see here. He wants us to see the pain. He wants us to see the self-sacrifice. And He wants us to look beyond it to another kind of pain and another kind of sacrifice. He wants us to see these guys running, these guys sprinting, these guys boxing, and He wants us to think about another kind of race, another kind of exercise. God wants us to look past those things. When when we see this runner, He wants us to see another kind of running, another kind of boxing. When you hear about all the self-denial, He wants us to see something else. When these, you've probably seen it. We just had the Olympics. I mean, you you know what it's like when somebody stands on a podium and they bow over and, and some kind of Olympic official comes along and puts the medals over their head. He wants you to look past that at another prize. And another who is bestowing the rewards of infinitely greater worth and value. That's what this is all about. It's all for an illustration. It's all for a far greater reality. And look, right here at the beginning, I want to be really clear. I want to be really plain. And I don't want there to be any misunderstanding among any of you about what's at stake here. Notice verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. You know what the reality is? Everybody in this room is running the race of life. Everybody is running the race of life. Some smaller group is running the race of professed Christianity. We're running these things. But not everybody's going to get the prize. And this is Paul's point. Running is all about the prize. And make no mistake about it, this prize is nothing other than life itself. Look at verse 26. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now, he's not talking about being disqualified from preaching. He's not saying left after preaching to others, I myself prove to be disqualified as a preacher. You have to understand, he's still using the same analogy. What's the analogy? An athlete in a race. What happens? With, have have any, any of you watched the Olympics and seen somebody that's been disqualified? What immediately becomes true of a disqualified runner or swimmer? 
They are no longer in contention for the prize. The prize is beyond their reach. They can't get it. The analogy is the same. He's not all of a sudden turning his attention to preaching. What he's saying is, even as a preacher, if I don't run this race right, I face disqualification. It doesn't matter if I proclaim the gospel. But what's important is that I be a partaker of the gospel that I'm preaching. That's what he said right before this. Brethren, I want you to see something. I want you to get the feel for this. Notice the context into 1 Corinthians 10. 4. Or maybe your Bible says moreover. But folks, what we have here is a conjunction introducing an explanation. In other words, Paul is saying you've got to run this way to get this prize and even if I fail on this thing, I get disqualified. Four. Let me give you an explanation to explain what I'm talking about here. Look at this. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers... What's the deal with our fathers? They got disqualified. Were they running the race? They were running the race as God's people. That's that's what this is all about. They were under the cloud. What does that mean? They identified with God's people. They had the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire. It, It guided them. They were there among God's people. They were out there in the wilderness. They passed through the sea. They were partakers of God's mighty works. All were baptized into Moses. All that means is they they were immersed into Him. They identified with Him. They were one with Him. When Moses went through the sea, they went through too. They were partakers of it. They ate of the same spiritual food. They, They ate the manna that came down. They drank from the same spiritual rock. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. You see, they were partakers. They got the overflow. They got the blessings. They they identified with God's people just like a lot of people in the church do. But they got disqualified because they didn't run right. Nevertheless, here it is. Here's their disqualification. With most of them, God was not pleased. They were overthrown in the wilderness. Overthrown in the wilderness didn't mean that they just lost their lives. According to Hebrews chapter 3, they didn't enter His rest. There's no heaven. They perished. Now these things took place for what? As examples of us. To us. For us. That we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, rose up to play. They didn't run right. They weren't running the race right, folks. If if any of you are watching pornography on the internet, you're not running the race right. You face disqualification. Any of you toying with alcohol and drugs in a way that is not pleasing to the Lord, you face disqualification. That's when it says they sat down to eat and drink to play. Brethren, this is the kind of thing. Excess. They weren't controlling their, their bodily desires. They were letting them go. They were letting them run. They were letting them free. You playing around with sexual immorality? You face disqualification. That means you don't get the prize. It means you're damned in the end. That's what happened to these people. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Brethren, we've got words here, overthrown, fell, destroyed. When Paul talks about disqualification and then starts chapter 10 with a joining a a joining conjunction there, he's giving us an explanation of what he's been talking about. He's not talking about disqualification from any kind of preaching. He's talking about losing your life forever if you don't run this race right. Folks, this is exactly the same word disqualified that shows up in 2 Corinthians 13.5. You don't need to go there, but I know a lot of you know this text. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? Some Bibles say you prove reprobate. Some say disqualified. It's the same exact word that we have over here in 1 Corinthians 9 and 27. It's the same word, disqualified. It means you fail to meet the test, the test of life. You fall out. You're without Christ. You don't get there. You may have enjoyed the overflow and spiritual blessings of Christ, the cloud above, 
But if you don't run well and run right, you get disqualified from this heavenly race. This is serious stuff, folks. Hell is real. And it's coming. And there's a way to run. These fallen Jews are examples to us of those who did not run right. Were they religious people? You better believe they were religious people. Did they identify with God? You better believe they identified with God. But they didn't get the prize. They didn't enter the rest. Folks, the prize of prizes is at stake. You probably does us all well to pay really close attention then to what's said here. So what Paul is saying in these verses is this. Eternal life hangs on the way we run. Not because we're saved by the way we run, but because how we run is the proving ground of what we really believe. It always is. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ saves. And those with exactly that kind of faith will run to win. And those without such saving faith, they only play it running. They don't take it serious. And God help us, brethren, the race of all races is the race from heaven to earth. That's the race that is before us. And to win the prize is everything. It's your life. It's your soul. It's your eternity. It is everything. If you don't win this race, you are eternally damned. You are eternally miserable. You are eternally undone. You are eternally forsaken. That's what happened to Christ when He bore the sin of His people. My God, my God, why have You forsaken Me? And if you don't win this race, that forsaking of God falls on your head. And you don't know in your worst day on this earth when you felt most depressed, most lonely, you don't know what it is to be forsaken by God. Men and women all around us They're racing, 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 racing. They're racing after riches and racing after success and racing after promotions and racing to retirement. Racing, racing, racing. And here it is. The prize of all prizes is offered to any who will look to Jesus and run this race. And I'll tell you what's even more pathetic than the world around us racing after riches and racing after retirement and racing after stuff and racing after empires and success and promotions is people in the church who claim to be in this race, but when you look for anything Olympian in them, it isn't there. And make no mistake about it. What is found in Olympic athletes, what they have in a physical sense that gets them to the winner's podium is what in a spiritual sense you must have or you will not win this prize. That is what Paul's saying. Don't miss that. This, this isn't, what I have to talk about today is not the difference between the mature and the immature. It's not about, it's not about the Christian that's going to be a hundredfold Versus the Christian that's going to be 30-fold fruitful in this life. We're talking about getting the prize or missing the prize. It's all or nothing. We've got people in the church that act like they're not taking this thing very seriously. Some of you are taking it dead serious. And others not so serious. I can remember when I was a brand new Christian. I was working engineer up in Michigan. We had corporate Olympics. And right, right at that time when we had the corporate Olympics, we had like some collegiate sprinter who, you remember that guy? What was his name? I don't remember. He, 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 was, he was fast. I don't even remember what school he went to. But he was the captain of our corporate Olympic team for the company we worked for. And the, I, I don't remember what all events our company got involved with, but I ran the 4 by 400 which is what this guy ran in. And he had us out there. We did tryouts. He had us working. He had us, I mean, he had us getting the the baton exchange down. And, uh, you know, I'd done some of that in in middle school. This this guy was working us. This guy was having us prepared. And the thing is, the day of the race, I'm standing out there on the track, 
and they had us lined up in a certain way, and they were trying to put us into he- different heats. And right af- in front of me were these guys that I went to high school with. They were two years older. They were, when the one guy was a brother of, of a guy that was in my class, but I hung out with these guys. When I was lost, I partied with these guys. I drank with these guys. And here they are, standing there in the line. And if I'm not mistaken, they didn't even have shorts on. They like had the same old Levi jeans from high school. And, and I, you know, I'm greeting these guys and I said, Hey, have you guys been trying out? You guys been practicing? No, not at all. You know, they're kind of clumsily doing, you know, stretches like this. And, and I mean, I knew these guys. These guys were partiers. These guys were, they, I didn't know if they were anymore, but they used to be drug users. I knew them to be heavy drinkers. And here they are. We haven't tried at all. We haven't practiced at all. I just told them, you guys are going to get killed. <laughs> and they did. Brethren, the, the, the sad thing is, that's how some Christians are. They're, t- they're taking this race to the prize of all prizes like those guys. Like it just doesn't matter. Well, you know, we'll show up. Those guys got blown away. And Paul's concerned that there are some folks in the church at Corinth Some folks that are in this church that run the Christian race the same way, you're going to get blown away. So he says, look at verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Now watch this. So run that you may obtain it. Now don't get confused over this. Paul's not trying to teach that in the Christian life we're all battling for one prize and only one of us gets it. So I've got to beat you to get it. In fact, that's just the opposite of what we find all through our Bibles. I mean, we find that we're supposed to exhort one another for what reason? That we not become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Why? To help one another get there. Remember, in the past I did a message on Christians saving Christians. I mean, that's a reality. We are to help one another get to the prize. Paul doesn't want you to focus in here on the fact that only one gets the prize. What he's saying is this. Look at the Olympic runner. Look at the sprinter. You see the guy that won? How did he get there? So run in the spiritual life with the same grit, determination, enthusiasm, commitment, and self-denial that it took that man in a physical sense to win that race. Christian, you've got to run that way if you'll have this prize. That's what he's saying. That's what it's all about, brethren. It's not that just one gets there. It's that there is a way the winner gets to the gold medal podium. And the way in the physical realm he does that is the way you need to run this spiritual life. You need to run the way a winner runs. Heaven's going to be populated with winners. And hell's going to be populated with losers. That's the reality. That's what we see here. How do winners run? How do winners run? How do they train? Brethren, they train to win and they run to win and they sacrifice what is necessary to sacrifice that they might win. They eat the right way to win. They strain, they sweat, they aggravate, they rest, they sleep. Their life is ordered in such a way to win. And everybody that's out there sitting on their backside having second helpings of desserts, they don't win. And that's just a reality. You've got to be on the leading, cutting edge if you're going to stand on that gold medal podium at the Olympics. People from all over the world, they've trained, they've given themselves, some of them their whole lives, at least for four years. They've trained, they strive, they know they're going up against the best. They run all out. You know this is true in the physical world. And Paul wants us to take that reality and transpose it over to the spiritual reality. And God is doing this through Paul in inspired fashion. He's saying, Christian, wake up with that same enthusiasm, with that same determination. We've got to apply ourselves. The half-hearted, 
the lazy, the sloppy, the lukewarm athlete with the cream puff stuffed in his mouth doesn't get the gold. It's just a reality. Now Paul takes us deeper here. Look at verse 25. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. We and imperishable. See, he talks about they and we, and he puts them together. Every athlete exercises self-control. Whether for the perishable or for the imperishable, every athlete exercises self-control. They do it for something perishable. Our athleticism is something for something imperishable. So, the conclusion of the matter, I do not run aimlessly. Now stop right there. Because he's ready to change his metaphor. Before he changes it to the boxer, I want to kind of pull together what he's saying here. Follow this. Every athlete exercises self-control. And then he shows us what they're after, but then he comes back to saying so. I mean, cut the middle stuff about the perishable and imperishable, and listen to what he's basically saying. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things, so I do not run aimlessly. You see what he's saying? I control myself so that I run with purpose. When I live my life, I do what I do on purpose. I do it in deliberate fashion. Any serious competitor has a training program that involves him or her in making self-controlled decisions to do what may be hard, to deny self, so that they can specifically get what they are aiming at. That's what he's talking about here. We are self-controlled. We don't live sloppy lives. You don't live a sloppy life if you want to win the race. You guys remember, uh, this, the, the Olympics happened to coincide with the two weeks that we were in Colorado. So we were able to catch some of that. There was a commercial. There was a commercial that, that they, it seemed we saw aired repeatedly. There's these various athletes, and what you have is the camera basically looking out of their eyeballs. You see them on a, you know, there's a bike there, and they're going down something. And, and you hear these athletes' voices saying stuff like, you know that best-selling book everyone's reading? I didn't read it. Another athlete says, I haven't had dessert in two years. Another says, I haven't watched TV since last summer. Another says, I don't not only take a day off, I don't even take a morning off. I, got, I was thinking about that commercial. That is a perfect example. I mean, it's like God is saying right there, that's it. That's how you win. You control yourself. You sacrifice. You give up everything you've got. They do it for a perishable wreath. Have any of you ever watched Chariots of Fire? I mean, that's, that's a, a movie about a Christian who ran in the Olympics back in the 20s. 1924 Olympics. Eric Little, it's about him. But you know there was another man who was a runner in that that was a pretty prominent figure. His name was Harold Abrahams. Do you remember, if any of you that watched that, when Abrahams was done, when he had won his gold, he went to his hotel room and he sat there and he's just empty and he's drinking whiskey or something. And that was it. Why? He spent his whole life to get this. And when he had it, it was just empty. You know, during those Olympics, they, they were talking to people about that had won gold medals. And many of them said that their gold medals were in their sock drawer. They train like they do for something that in the end leaves them empty and they put in a sock drawer. And are they going to train more diligently for that than we will for the prize of all prizes? Brethren, what are we up against here? We are up against eternity with Christ. Beholding Him, the pure in heart will see God. We 
will walk with him in white. There are riches of Christ that that far surpassing, immeasurable, through all the coming ages. They will be lavished out upon us. We're talking about sins forgiven forever, eternal life, more abundant life. We're talking about an inheritance, an inheritance that makes anything in this world look wretched. Brethren, we are talking about everything. We are talking about the preservation and the life of our souls and our bodies forever. We are talking about escaping hell and damnation and total loss. We are talking about having Christ and being married with Christ and reigning with Christ, sitting on Christ's throne. We're talking about everything. Literally, brethren, to get this prize is to get everything. And they're going to run like they do, train like they do for that which they stick in a sock drawer. And we've got the prize of all prizes and we're going to be sloppy. We're going to be lukewarm. We're going to be kicked back. We're going to take this thing like it doesn't really matter. No, brethren. That is not it. That is not what the Corinthians should be doing and that's not what we should be doing. And what he dives into is examples of those who were destroyed because they didn't run right. This is the, your soul, your life, your all is on the line. Look at these words in verse 26. So I do not run aimlessly. Christian, what absolutely essential instruction this is for us. You see what Paul's saying? I don't just let life happen to me. I don't get up and just walk, waltz out into this world to be blown around by all the winds that tend to want to blow me. I go out with purpose. I live my life on purpose. Brethren, you can... I remember... I remember the missionary that we support in China. He was talking about, um, in one of the times he spoke here in the United States, speaking about Hudson Taylor. You remember Hudson Taylor? He, he, went, he moved from his home. He was wanting to be a missionary in China. And so when he moved into the inner city in some low rental district in, in London's inner city. He went in there. He purposely lived there so that he could deny himself, so that he could reach out to these people in poverty. He slept on a board. He did not eat the same food that he grew up with. He ate very simple food. Why? He didn't have to. He could have gone back home, ate better, slept on a soft bed. Why make those sacrifices? Brethren, he was doing it because he was preparing himself for something. He realized this body needed to be put where he wanted. He needed to master it. It was not going to master him. He, was, he did these things with purpose. Jonathan Edwards very specifically calculated in his eating habits what caused headaches. And he would not eat those things that caused headaches. He was very careful about the way he ate because he knew that it it would adversely affect his spiritual walk. Amy Carmichael got to the place where I believe she was down to eating only one meal a day. Why? Because, brethren, that was consistent with the kind of spiritual life she wanted to live. Men and women throughout history that have done things, been things, run this race well, they have been those that have been disciplined. There's been self-control. Brethren, this is, this is huge. Do we run aimlessly? I can remember, I can remember in, in uh, high school, we were seniors. We had a pretty laid-back gym teacher. And a bunch of us would always say, hey, let us go out to the track and uh, you know, practice sprinting. Or We typically take the poles, pole vaulting poles and uh, you know, maybe we led them to believe that we were going to go out and actually practice becoming pole vaulters. You know what we'd do? We'd go out there. Maybe we'd try a jump or two. We'd run around chasing each other with these things. Jousting. We'd lay around on the mats. We'd tell stories. Some other guys might come out there that weren't kind of in our clique. And we'd chase them around with the poles. <laughs> you think any of us won Olympic medals in pole vaulting? In fact, do you think any of us even... even won anything in high school. No. 
We didn't do anything with any purpose. We didn't go out there to do any. Everything, everything was aimless. We just went out there doing this, doing that, doing other things. We didn't train to win. God's telling us that every serious competitor has a training program of diligent self-control if they're going to win. I mean, Christian, what's your training program? What are you doing in life to win this race? If you say, well, I don't really think about it. I mean, what do you think? You think guys get on the gold medal podium when they're, when they're approaching the, the 400 butterfly when they haven't really thought about it? They haven't given any thought to how they're going to get there? They haven't given any thought? But brethren, those guys, they practice with an aim in view. I want to be as fast as I can. I want to be as quick as I can. I want to accelerate as fast as I can. I want to get off that line as quick as I can. I want to be in the absolute best physical shape I can be to make this thing happen. Are we striving? Do we have a plan to be as physically and spiritually more so in shape to win this race? This is what it's all about. Do, are, we, are we deliberate, brethren? Are we deliberate? And listen, theology is great, but theology by itself is not enough. Theology by itself is like the guy who goes in the library, he pulls out the book on how to become a 400 meter butterfly swimmer, and he sits there and reads it. I mean, some of the instruction might be good. Brethren, that's like the Scriptures. You can study your theology, but if you're not putting it into practice with a disciplined life, then it doesn't amount to anything. It doesn't go anywhere. You can have all the theology, all the right thinking, all the doctrine. You can understand the doctrines of grace. But if you're not applying yourself to getting the prize at the end, then you're not going to win. And Paul gets even more severe here. We, I mean, we move forward. He's going to throw another image. This time it's the boxer in similar fashion. Look there at verse 26. In similar fashion, he's going to show us he's not aimless in the Christian life. He pumps up the intensity here. I do not box as one beating the air. Well, I mean, you can understand a boxer beating the air. It's when he takes a swing at somebody and he misses, right? I mean, if you're in competition in boxing, guess what happens when you swing and hit the air? You've expended energy. You haven't gotten anywhere. You're no closer to the metal. That was only, I mean, that didn't get you any points. That isn't getting you close to the gold. That didn't accomplish anything. And he says, when I swing, I don't beat at the air. But I discipline my body. Now he shows us who he's fighting against. And this word discipline is really interesting. You look this Greek word up, it literally means to strike the area under the eye and beat it black and blue. He's saying, as I'm preparing in this race, I hit my body. Some, some scriptures say pummel, buffet. He beats his body. Okay, brethren, are you starting to see this? You, you think, what does this look like? I'm trying to win this race. What is self-control? How does it look to be self-controlled? How does it look to not be just floundering about aimlessly. It means this. It means I live my life in a calculated way to deal with this body. Why? Why do I need to deal with this body? Let's, let's give a little short theology of the body. And what do we find? We go over to Romans chapter 6. You know what I find about this body? I find that it's in this mortal body where sin seeks to reign. And it seeks to reign here by taking advantage of the passions of my body. The same passions Peter warns us about that are warring against us. They seek to destroy us. They come against us, folks. Sin is in this mortal body seeking to reign. It seeks to cause us to give place to the passions of this body. Do you see what happened to those that were destroyed? What happened? They gave place to the passions of their body. Sexual immorality. That's why I say, you're giving, way, you're giving place to that pornography on the internet. You're giving place to sexual immorality. You're giving, giving place to a constant life of, of not controlling your physical appetites, your eating appetites, your drinking appetites, your sexual appetites. 
your, your appetites. This body craves ease. This body craves satisfaction. This body wants satisfaction when it comes to food. It wants satisfaction when it comes to drink. It wants satisfaction when it comes to sex. It wants satisfaction when it comes to ease in life, pleasure in life. This body likes to be caressed. It likes to be pampered. And Paul knows it. He knows that what is natural to this body keeps him from excelling spiritually like he needs to. That's what he understands. And he says, I am master of my body. Body, you are not going to master me. I master you. That's the idea. And he gets, he gets serious. He's beating this thing. He says, Paul says, I'm going for the prize. So I punch and I pound this body in order to show who's master. Now, we have to be very careful here. Because the same apostle over in Colossians chapter 2 says this, asceticism and severity to the body doesn't profit in putting the flesh to death. It doesn't, it doesn't profit in basically killing this body. It's, severity to the body doesn't kill the flesh. And, and, but isn't this interesting? Severity to the body, he says, is unprofitable in you know, conquering the flesh. And yet, I look at 1 Corinthians 9, and I say, Paul, you're beating your body black and blue. That seems severe. So what's the difference? What's the difference between the runner looking to win the prize with self-control and deliberate punching of the body? How's that setting over against Asceticism. Legalism. What's asceticism? Some of you are probably saying, I don't even know what that is. I can't follow anything you're saying. Asceticism is basically like what the Catholic priests used to do when they would scourge themselves. Or what Catholics will do by walking on their knees. It's, it's basically being severe, punishing this body in hopes that that's going to make you more acceptable to God, more righteous. <clears throat> now brethren, <clears throat> there's a big difference between saying our church is not going to eat fish on Fridays. We're going to deny ourselves. And I require you guys to do that. You see, that's legalism. I'm, I'm requiring something of you that... God's Word doesn't require. That's legalism. That's asceticism. And that, all that does is puff people up. Because that makes people feel like, well, I've accomplished that. You know, look what I do. It's like, it's like the, the Pharisee there in Luke, right? I fast twice in a week. But, you know what? If it's Friday afternoon, and Brother David comes over with a couple plates full of fish, and I determine to fast that day because... I was really concerned about the advancement of the gospel over in China. And I was wanting, I had set that day aside, and I didn't realize David was coming. He comes with a fish, and I forbear to eat the fish because I want to continue to fast. And I'm telling my body, I'm master of you. Get in line. No matter how much that fish smells good, you are fasting. You see, there's a huge difference. One is on the road to winning the prize. The other is asceticism, and it's only on the road to embellishing the flesh. There's a huge difference between the two. You see, Paul, Paul could come along and say this. This is, this is the idea that, that he throws out in the 1 Corinthians letter. Several times he says, all things are lawful for me. You see, he backs away from legalism. He backs away from that whole ascetic view that you have to deny yourself certain things. Or that ascetic view that I have to fast twice in the week like the Pharisee said. He backs away from that. And he says to the Corinthians, all things are lawful. But what all things are not helpful. All things don't build up. You see, that's what he's recognizing. He says, with purpose, I beat this body into mastery. I want my body to do what it tells me to do. Now, brethren, this is huge. Because if you're living your life 
and the alarm goes off at 7, and your body says, I want to sleep longer, hit the snooze. And you say, okay. And your body says, I want dessert. And you say, okay. I want seconds. Okay. You see, you start living a life like that, where you don't beat your body into mastery, but it's mastering you all the time. Then all of a sudden, you're sitting in front of the computer, and it says, I want to look at sex. And see, you've spent your whole life saying, yes, 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 yes. You've been making provision for the flesh. You've been feeding this monster. You just say yes to it all the time. Yes, 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 yes. No self-control. No beating it. No pummeling it. No telling it your master. And now all of a sudden, it wants some kind of sexual immorality. You're so used to saying yes to it, you don't hardly know how to say no to it. And all of a sudden you fall. You say yes to it, yes to it, yes to it. And it's saying, I want seconds, I want thirds, I want this, I want that. Brethren, you don't win the prize that way. Because what's true about this body, this this is one of the reasons why I wanted to emphasize that point this morning, that brethren, as Christians, even if we delight in the Lord, We just don't say yes to everything because we have to understand this. We have attached to us this body that still has a fallenness about it and this body is constantly wanting to do things that pull me off to praying the way I ought, fasting the way I ought, studying Scripture the way I ought, getting up at the time I ought, living a disciplined life. Brethren, I'll tell you this. Going out and evangelizing on these streets will cost you something. Your body will say, I don't want to. I'd rather stay on my backside in front of the TV. That's easier. Your body's saying, no, I don't want to do that. I heard, I heard recently somebody was telling me that Paul Washer had, had based on the example of one of uh, the, somebody from church history, he saw that they got up at 4 a.m. and he said, I'm going to do that. You think your body wants to get up at 4 a.m.? I'll tell you, it doesn't. If you're going to get up at 4 a.m. and study Scripture and pray, if you're going to do it at that hour, you've got to be master. Look, you start living a life where you tell your body, you are going out on these streets to evangelize. You are not going to have dessert. You are going to fast for the next 48 hours. You are going to do what I tell you to do. You are going to bed at 10 p.m. so that you can get up at a proper hour. You are going to live this life because I want to read the Scripture. I am not eating that food because it gives me headaches. That will cost me a whole day. I'm not going going down that road. I will give up soda if it's not good for me and it causes me to be tired or it causes me to stumble somehow. Body, you are getting me to that prize and I'm determined you are. And and you see, when you live a life like that, now all of a sudden you've been stoned at Lystra. Can you imagine? He gets up and he goes back into the same city. What do you think his body was saying? No, Paul! That hurt. If you go back in there, it's likely to happen again. I don't want to be stoned. You see, I mean, Americans are so used to giving their bodies everything they want, they don't hardly, they'd be hitting the road. He goes back in there. It's like Paul said, shut up, body. That is where we're going. We're headed back in there. I mean, he went through a life, fastings often. He was beaten by rods. He was scourged. He was stoned. He suffered sip. Shipwreck. Can you imagine his body saying to him, No, Paul, not another missionary journey. This this is this will hurt. Jail's not fun. Jail's not nice. Paul, remember, these aren't the jails that are they're gonna have two thousand years from now in America. These are the jails they have today. These things are not nice places. Remember, we don't get fed good there. It's not comfortable there. There's no air conditioning there. Remember, there's maggots in the food there. Brethren, when you've lived a life where you've said no to this body repeatedly and you've got it and beaten it into control and you've given it black and blue eyes, you can come along and say, I recognize I'm a Christian. I'm a free man. I'm a son of the King who pays taxes. The people out there are the children. It's like we're free men, folks. And all things are lawful. All things are lawful that are not unlawful. They're all lawful. 
but they're not all expedient. They're not all good. They don't all build up and they're not all helpful. And we need to be discerning and we need to beat these bodies like we mean to get the prize. Brother, this, this is run by faith. But when we look at it and we say, I really believe, my faith is this, that spending proper time in the mornings with Christ in prayer is best. So body, you're going to get up so I can do that. Body, you're not going to eat anything that hinders that. Body, you know what? These guys fell in the wilderness from sexual immorality. Body, I'm going to keep you in control. You are not going to be driven. You are not going to, I'm not going to be mastered by your sexual desires. I am not going to sit in front of a TV and gratify your eyes with what's on there. I'm not going to sit in front of a computer and gratify your eyes and ears what's on there. It's a disciplined life. Brethren, this is what it's all about. You don't live this kind of discipline. You don't run with the intensity that a physical runner runs. You don't get the prize at the end. We live in bodies that its, it's basic natural wiring is to resist. Resist. It's got passions. It's got impulses. It's got desires that are constantly pulling us. Brethren, you feel it. I feel it. It's constantly like a rope tied to us and we're trying to run. And sometimes it's like we're in molasses because this thing is pulling us back. And part of the reason is we have not disciplined this body. And brethren, if you don't, if you don't have a faith that leads you to say no to this body, to say yes to God, what Paul's saying is you don't get the prize. And you can play with those words and you can do somersaults with them and acrobatics with them. But brethren, in the end, that's what's happening here. Winners say no to their bodies. The writer of Hebrews is saying we need to lay aside things. You need to lay aside the weights. You need to weigh, lay aside the things that hold you back in order to run this race. This is life and death. This is, like I said before, this is not just about maturity levels in the Christian life. This is about life and death. This is, this is all of it. I mean, we, we live in this self-gratification crazy society and as Christians, we need to be ready to follow in the likes of Jonathan Edwards and Hudson Taylor and Amy Carmichael where we're, where, where we're not becoming like Catholicism, where we're just these ascetics that are trying to, trying to make these laws that we have to walk on our knees on glass. Brethren, we're doing things because we love Christ and we want to be with Christ and we're hungry after souls. We're going to discipline these bodies. Brethren, I can tell you this. You're not, none of you that have aspirations for the mission field. I've, I've had at times people come to me and say, you know, I think God's calling me to the mission field. And I, I know from people they live with that they can't get out of bed before noon. You're not going to make it on the mission field. You may not even make it in this race. Brethren, that is not what wins the day. What wins the day is people that say, I know that this Word of God is more important to me than the meat I eat. I've got to be in it. I've got to study it. I've got to meditate on it. And I'm going to make it a priority in my life. And body, I want you to know. And if you resist me, my fist is up and I'm going to punch you under the eye black and blue. Because we are going to be in this Word. And we are going to be on our knees. And we are going to fast. And we are going to pray. And we are going to go after souls. And we are going to seek to love the brethren. And we are going to seek to deny ourselves. And this is the way in. Christ said it. Unless you deny yourself, there's no way in, folks. The Bible is serious about this. That's why it says strive to enter in. There, it is a race that we must strive at. We must go hard, brethren. Strive to enter that rest. You have this, this kind of language repeatedly comes at us in Scripture. There's an effort. There's an exertion. And faith will do it. Faith looks at the prize at the end. It looks at having Christ. It looks at having victory. It looks at the reward at the end and it says in faith, I want you. And body, you're going to serve me in getting me there. You're not going to hold me back. I came back from this, from this trip and I guess, I guess Brother Tafik did a message on confession while I was gone and it, it seems like it stirred some people and there, there have been um, various folks that have confessed some sin to me since I've been back. Brethren, I look at that 
And I look at the fact that, you know, we just, this last week, we disciplined one of the young men out of this church. But the truth is that some of the sins he was involved with, some of the rest of you are involved with as well. It wasn't just him isolated. Now, he was unrepentant in it, and that's why it led. But brethren, I know that there are folks here that you have given place to the body when it comes to alcohol. I'm not saying Scripture forbids it completely, but the way that you've given yourself to it was sinful. It wasn't right. It was done in the, in the face of unbelievers. Some of you have given place to sexual sin in ways... And brethren, in the end, if you basically are just living a life where you're, you're basically just gluttonously letting your body dictate everything and say, I like that. That seems pleasurable. Somebody cracks a bottle. You know, you're not used to saying no to your body. Oh, that seems fun. That seems enjoyable. That seems, you know, in this self gratification crazed age, that's how everything is. What's fun? What's pleasing? What's good for me? And Christ is there beckoning us. Deny yourselves. This is the path to life. That's what Paul's saying to these Corinthians. These Corinthians were falling to these same kind of things. And he says, Corinthians, even if I as a preacher don't run this race right, I'm going to be disqualified. Even the Jews that went before you, they're an example for you. See what they did with sexual immorality and food and drink? And they fell. Corinthians, run the race to win. Folks, Christians, today, in our day, in this church, run this race to win. Be serious. Christ is worth it. Christ is everything. You learn to say no to these bodies. You learn to tell them to shut up. You learn to tell them who's master. Brethren, we have... We have the grace of God to do that. We are no longer like the Gentiles that are in bondage, driven by all the passions of the flesh. Sin will not have dominion over us because sin will not be able to reign in our mortal bodies and cause us to obey the passions of this body. We now, by the Spirit of God, are equipped to say no to this body. And in faith, to recognize Christ is better. Christ is all. Brethren, what's your training regimen look like? If you're in the spiritual realm, supposed to be comparable to these guys in the physical realm who get the prize, what does your life look like? I mean, you have to ask yourself that. What does it look like? What are you saying no to that you might get to heaven? That you might say yes to things that are necessary to get to heaven? What does it look like? Is it sloppy? Lazy? Stay in bed till 11, 12 o'clock? Rare, you know, some maybe read your Bible once a week? You think you're going to heaven? You say, you make it sound like it's by works. I'm making it sound like the Bible makes it sound. If you're running the race like that, it says your run's bad, and that's always an indication that your faith is bad. You don't believe something aright. You don't see Christ precious right. You don't see eternal life to be as valuable as it is. And you don't see your effort to be that necessary as it is. You need to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There's a work. There's a striving. We need to labor, brethren. So let's not fall into asceticism, but let's fall into following Paul as he followed Christ. Let us learn the art of beating our bodies black and blue Self-controlled. Remember, it's not aimless. He doesn't just beat it for the sake of beating it. There's an aim. His aim is the prize. His aim is Christ. His aim is souls. There's an aim. 
Brethren, live your life on purpose, with a purpose, deliberate. God help us. Amen.